All right, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to be here. Um, General Campbell, Commander Resolute Support, good to see some familiar faces. Um, this is probably my last opportunity to gather a big, big group like this to, to talk about Afghanistan. I'm going to change command probably the first week of March, first, second, third. We're still working on date and time, but as soon as we get that, we'll get that out to you. Um, so I just want to take an opportunity to, to uh, get out in front of you, answer any of your questions. I would tell you a couple things up front. I've uh, been on the ground about 18 months, my third tour in Afghanistan, and very honored and uh, privileged to have the opportunity to work with the Afghan security partners. Uh, every single day I'm amazed by what I see out there. There's some very, very good things that you guys don't write about, and there's some very, very bad things that you always write about. Uh, so there's very challenging times here for Afghanistan, and I do really believe uh, that the Afghan security forces um, every single day sacrifice for their country, their families sacrifice for their countries, and the coalition, um, Resolute Support, has been there 14, 15 years on the ground, ISAP before that, and continue to work with our Afghan partners every single day to try to build their, their capability. And I'm proud to have been uh, part of this and proud to have been here three times. And I will leave again the first week of March, uh, but Afghanistan will always be in my heart. And so um, it has been a very, very difficult year, 2015, for all of Afghanistan. It's been fundamentally different. We knew that was going to be the case before we entered 2015 based on the downsizing of uh, ISAF then the new mission of Resolute Support, um, two narrow missions of train, advise, and assist, and then from a U.S. perspective, um, counterterrorism. Uh, but we knew that the Taliban and all the other insurgents would take advantage of that, that they wanted to show that they were acting on a position of strength, so it was a very, very tough fight. They continue to fight today. The fighting seasons we've known in the past have kind of gone away. And it's been a continuous fight since about January 2015. Um, tough fight going on in Helmand right now, an incident down in Sangin uh, early this morning that we're, we're tracking very closely. And I just got an update on that. And I'll talk about that if you want. Uh, but again, I'll have a couple things to say at the end, but I really look forward to your questions. Uh, but my message really here is that uh, proud to have served here in Afghanistan. I'm proud of the men and the women from the 40 plus countries that continue to come to Afghanistan, that sacrifice, that leave their families. And I think if you ask any of them, um, has it been worthwhile, they would tell you yes. And they see changes every single day. And sometimes that's very hard when you're very close to it. Uh, but when they get back home and they kind of look at it and see, did they make a difference? You know, what I tell them is they absolutely did. And I ask them to thank their families. Uh, and I know that all of Afghanistan really appreciates that as well. So with that, I'll take any of your questions. Please. Now, let, me, let me answer the first one, I'll let you follow up, but um, I didn't hear the first part. I, I understood the thing about ISIS or Daesh and fighting terrorism. I didn't understand the first part of that. The first part was you said that uh, instead of you are facing terrorism, you have fought for two years in uh, Afghanistan, yeah. terrorism, but now you are facing ISIS. So uh, what are the plans to defeat ISIS and also the Taliban in the coming year? And the second question is this. All right, hold on your second question. Let me answer the first one first. First off, again, it has been a very tough fight. Uh, a lot of things have changed. As I said in 2015, there was a, a large drawdown in the coalition forces. Afghan security forces took on security uh, totally. Um, we've been in a train, advise, and assist role. And then from a U.S. perspective, I do wear a counterterrorism hat, so there have been some CT actions ongoing. We are looking very hard and every single day continue to train, advise, and assist counterterrorism with our Afghan partners so they can build their own capacity to fight this. And I would tell you, uh, every single night around this country, there's four or five different operations that Afghan CT forces are conducting um, every night. And so, you know, as I said in the past, um, 
for every bad thing that you hear about, a magnetic ID going off in Kabul or something, there's probably nine or ten that they stopped. And uh, they don't get enough recognition. And that, that really is a special operating forces, both in the MOD and the MOI and also NDS that stay after this every single night. And it's good that uh, you don't have to hear about them. Uh, but they are keeping the enemy tamped down in many places, and if they weren't doing what they do every single night, you'd see much more high-profile attacks. So on the CT perspective, what we'll continue to do is we have a partner in President Ghani uh, and Dr. Abdullah that want to be a regional partner, that want to continue to grow Afghanistan's CT capability, and we're going to continue to be here to, to do that, and it continues to get better and better every single day. They want to engage the entire region to make sure that the region understands that CT or terrorism knows no boundaries. Um, they don't have to follow any rules, and they can just go kill innocent women and children, innocent civilians, and so that the entire region has to stand up against terrorism like ISIL, like Daesh, and, and fight this together. And it shouldn't just be Afghanistan's problem, but it's a, it's a regional problem. On Daesh in particular inside of Afghanistan, we've seen it grow since about January 2015, uh, where we called it nascent. About a month or two ago, we called it operationally, uh, moving toward operationally uh, dependent here. And what happens is, I don't believe they have the ability to go attack Europe or go attack the United States, but left unchecked, that that's absolutely what they want to do. That is their intent. They want to grow throughout Nangarhar. They want to build into Kunar. They want to establish the Khorasan uh, Caliphate, the province here. And they said that openly. Um, about two and a half, three weeks ago, uh, I was provided uh, with additional authorities to strike Daesh, and we have put a lot more pressure in the last three weeks, particularly uh, in Nangarhar on, on Daesh. And we'll continue to work with our Afghan partners on the best way to move forward uh, fighting Daesh so that it can't take root here. Daesh and the Taliban fight each other, so they're in competition with each other uh, as well. And so we'll continue to work, work through that. On the Taliban piece, you know, again, the Taliban have no, uh, no vision for the future of Afghanistan. They, they, they don't believe in anything to do with education. They don't believe in women's rights. They don't believe in the Afghan constitution. All they believe in is violence in killing women and children. I can't put it any other way. Um, you know, up in Boglin right now, you have two power lines up there. Uh, one of them had one, one cut that's actually been fixed. The other one coming out of Highway 1 had two cuts. They're working on those. Hopefully in the next day or so, those will be back up. But the Taliban continue to try to, even as forces go in there, to try to fix those lines or attacking them. Because again, they don't care about the people of Afghanistan. And uh, so when they do those things, you know, there's no future for the Taliban. The future for the Taliban is to do exactly what President Ghani has asked them to do, and that's become part of the process, become part of the political process. You know, why are Afghans killing Afghans? Um, and so I think the Taliban got to take note. Uh, I think the message to the Taliban is that the, the international community is going to continue to stay here uh, for years and years. We just talked about that in NATO this week, uh, Minister of Defense um, Stan Exai and I had an opportunity to input to the Chiefs of Defense about a week and a half ago to all the NATO countries, and then um, all the NATO countries got together uh, Wednesday and Thursday this week and recommitted really a long commitment toward the future of Afghanistan, which will culminate uh, this summer with a uh, financial commitment at the Warsaw Conference for 2018, 2019, 2020. So as I look at Afghanistan, and the message for me is that we need to talk about Afghanistan five-year increments at least. Quit talking one year at a time, because that emboldens the Taliban. That, that provides instability um, for the Afghan people, for the Afghan security forces. So we need to talk longer term, because all the nations are committed for a long-term commitment here. You had a second question, then we'll... Yeah, again, the Taliban, you know, when you're fighting a counterinsurgency, when you only have to take one or two people and lay out an IED and, and kill innocent women and children, when you take a magnetic IED and, and throw it on a busload of innocent civilians, when you are able to just ambush people in the hills and take off running, uh, that is a very, very tough fight. Uh, and the Afghan security forces continue to build their capability to go after that fight. They're building their air force. I think many of you may have been around uh, the other day when President Ghani uh, talked about the rebirth of the Afghan Air Force, and um, they now have fixed-wing bombers. They'll continue to grow that capability. They have Little Bird helicopters that are that are fighting right now down in Sangin. Uh, they have additional MI-35s that India gave to them. They're fighting today down in Sangin as well. So they'll continue to build their capability to go after the Taliban. But in the end, I think we all expect that there has to be a political solution to the end of this conflict. And... Um, 
and President Ghani said that Afghanistan has to lead this, and, and he is doing that along with Dr. Abdullah, and the international coalition will continue to work with him. Please. Yeah, again, I don't deal in those kind of numbers. You know, the intel community, uh, they provide me different estimates, and it depends on who in the intel community you talk about. Uh, what I'd rather talk about is, you know, how we continue to build the Afghan capacity and capability to fight those. The number that I have put out there, or have been quoted, I've seen in papers for at least Daesh is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 to 3,000. Uh, focus primarily in, in Nangahar. But again, those numbers depends on what day you ask that question and how you really count that. Uh, I think over the last 14, 15 years, the number on the Taliban that I've heard is somewhere in the 30,000 range, but that was 10 years ago, and 10 years now is still 30,000. And I know that over the last 14, 15 years, the casualties that the, the Taliban have taken are quite huge. In fact, a lot was made in 2015 about the Afghan security force casualties, which uh, were the most they've had, and we knew that it was going to be a very, very tough fight. Uh, but what we don't talk a lot about is the Taliban casualties, and, and the reports that we get is the numbers of Taliban casualties for 2015 are the highest they've had as well. Um, so, again, I don't deal with those kind of numbers. We really look hard at uh, improving the Afghan uh, security force capability in a train advised and assist role. Please. Yeah, again, I like to look toward the future as opposed to look back in the past, although the past can help inform, you know, where you're going to move toward the future. Uh, I did read the CIGAR report, and, you know, just like with the CIGAR, like with the intelligence community, um, it's in definitions and how you count what control means. Um, I talked about it last week when I testified both to the HASC and the SASC. Uh, the number of district centers that I thought, based on our metrics, had been taken over in the last fighting season and that was in the neighborhood of eight or nine, ten, somewhere around there. It was in single digits. And some of those had even been taken back by the Afghan security forces, so it depends on how you count that. Um, and then there were probably another uh, 20 or 30 uh, that were teetering both ways, depending on that what day. And then there was a large number, probably in the 20 percentile range, that were at risk. So the 30 percentile that he, that he uses – um, may not be far off, but again, try not to speculate on the numbers. I'd ask you to take a look as, as President Ghani, Dr. Abdullah, um, and even at Resolute Support, and as I talk to the MOD and the MOI, when we take a look at Afghanistan, we really do have to prioritize, you know, what's important to the people of Afghanistan. And what the President can't do is go say, hey, if you're in the outermost part of Afghanistan, way out in the west someplace, or way up in the north, or way down in the south, that you're not important. You know, he would never survive. The people could not accept that. But he also understands that, you know, at 352,000, when they're totally full strength, which they're not at this point in time, the Afghan security forces can't be everywhere throughout this country, so they have to prioritize. So as I look at it, we look at the major roads, we look at the major cities, um, we look at the places that have a lot of infrastructure, and as you take a look at those places, the Taliban don't have a lot at all. And so in all the reports I've read, the Taliban have not been able to get to their strategic goals. Uh, when they do take over a district center, it's usually temporarily. Now, the difference in, in 2015 was, again, Kunduz and the first provincial capital that, that was overrun. Uh, my, my idea, or my thought, is that the Taliban never had uh, the idea that they are going to take over Kunduz. It was kind of an opportunity piece. They got in there. There was some collusion, a lot of other pieces with the police and the army and where they were positioned, uh, and a lot of the reasons that have been brought out in the report that was done by, by Afghanistan that President Ghani bravely went out and commissioned to do, and, you know, showed that the Afghan security forces went right back in and within a matter of days, for the most part, took back over a city of over 300,000. Now, there were sporadic uh, pockets of resistance that took a week or two, but again, the special operating forces and then the Afghan uh, police and army got right back in there. 
And as soon as they started going back in, for the most part, the Taliban fled. Again, they have no desire. They're not going to govern Kanduz. They don't have a future for Afghanistan. Um, but Tim, going back to question, 30 percent under control of the Taliban. I would tell you there's many probably areas out in the rural areas that uh, the government of Afghanistan may have not done a good job of providing governance. And in those places, if the Taliban are there and they provide any kind of services to the people of those districts, then they, they think they're under that, that kind of control. Please. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot in that. I'm not sure what your question was, but I'll say no, maybe, and yes. But uh, no, I, I got it. So look, when I got here 18 months ago, we were on a glide path to go to 1,000 people Kabul-centric, right? And we didn't have a CT plan past 2016. We're now on a path where the president, has, uh, the United States president, has, has provided me uh, 9,800 U.S. troops. That doesn't include the additional thousands and thousands we have on the NATO side, but 9,800 U.S. through most of 2016. And at the end of 2016, we'll come down to, to the 5,500 number, and we'll focus primarily on CT in 2017 and beyond with very limited train advise and assist as, as we move forward. I don't see us, well, also under that 9,800, what we were able to get is staying in several places in Kabul, staying in Bagram, staying in Jalalabad, staying in Kandahar. And so that gives us a lot of uh, options and flexibility, so I think it was a, a very good decision. Germany is committed to staying up in the north in Mazar Sharif. I was up there uh, yesterday. And Italy is committed uh, through 2016 right now, to, is committed out in the west in Herat. I was out there uh, Monday. And so NATO, again, made a decision probably November, December time frame after President Obama made his decision in October to continue support through 2016. And many countries want to stay in 2017. So when we made the decision on the 9,800 to 5,500, there are a lot of assumptions uh, inside of that. And again, President Obama, the rest of the folks have taken a look and said, you know, again, it's going to depend on conditions on the ground. If those assumptions don't play out or conditions on the ground change, then the commanders on the ground have a duty and responsibility to go back to their senior leadership and say, this didn't pan out or this did, and this is what I, what I need. So I, I think um, there's an opportunity there. Um, again, I don't get fixated on the number piece. I look at capability as we go forward. And I think NATO is going to continue to stay involved here. The U.S. will continue to stay involved. And uh, I have already provided additional uh, requests through my senior leadership uh, for 2016. And then General Nicholson and I will make sure we're in sync before I leave that he and I have talked. And he, he will provide a 90-day assessment, I believe, uh, back to NATO in the United States on where he thinks it ought to go after 2016. Please. How come only the Afghan folks thank me and the U.S. reporter didn't thank me? What's up with that? Yeah, well, that's a great question. That's a policy question. That's a political question. It's not a military question. But you know, what, what I would tell you is um, the United States made a decision several years ago, again, to downsize or turn over the security to the Afghan security forces, and as part of that, uh, not to be in combat operations, all right, and in combat operations uh, going out planning to attack the Taliban, which I agree is the biggest threat to the national government in Afghanistan at this point in time, not, not Daesh. Um, and so we've looked at that very, very hard, and, and the Afghan security forces continue to build their capability to go after the Taliban. Now, if you're a U.S. soldier uh, and you're out on a 
patrol around Bagram or Jalalabad or Kandahar, uh, and you're wearing all your body armor and you're carrying a weapon and somebody shoots at you, uh, if you don't want to think that's combat, that's okay. But, you know, they're not actively going out there and planning large combat operations. They're doing force, pro force protection patrols, that, that kind of thing. So that's, that's how we make the distinction of in combat or not combat. And for the most part, we have two very limited uh, mission sets here again. Train, advise, and assist. So that's where we primarily focus is build the Afghan capability. And then in a counterterrorism piece. And that's really focused on those elements that have a desire uh, to do something back to the United States, Al-Qaeda, and the remnants of Al-Qaeda, and or Daesh, which Daesh has said it wants to go and attack Europe and the United States as well. So that's the distinction. Please, right here. No. Again, our mission is train, advise, and assist, and then counterterrorism mission. Um, we do train, advise, and assist at different levels, all right? So from a conventional perspective, for the most part, I do that on the ministries, on MOI and MOD, and then at the cores. Uh, and we work on what we call eight essential functions to get after systems and processes to build an institutional army so that it has a foundation to continue on and on for years and years. Uh, we do do train, advise, assist at the tactical level only with the special operating forces. So with the MOD, special operating forces, your national mission forces, your Katehas, your commandos, and then with your MOI, special police, GCPSU, we do tactical level advising. Uh, and again, so when Katehas go out, they're going to have folks do train, advise, assist that are with them, all right? But they're not going across the objective. They're not actively going out to fight, but if they get attacked, they have to be able to provide force protection to themselves. If they get attacked uh, and somebody is firing on them and we have the capability to protect uh, the special forces both from a U.S. perspective and the Afghan security forces, I'm going to do that. And that's where you see Apache helicopters, bombs, drones, th those kind of things. But we're not, we're not changing. The mission hadn't changed, all right? Um, down in Helmand, I have made that a priority over the winter to continue to build up the 215th um, from a hope from the readiness perspective to make sure they're ready for the next uh, fighting season or the summer um, and I put a lot more special forces down there to help set some of the conditions but again they're at a train advise and assist um, mission now I've, again I said it's been in the papers we put another 500 soldiers down there that's just re that's just replacing another unit I already have down there and a lot of those guys are doing force protection, and a lot of them will move into a train, advise, and assist role. We are trying to be very imaginative on how we can uh, change what we're doing based on lessons learned, all right? So in 2015, uh, there were some lessons learned we got on train, advise, and assist. And I said, if we get more people, put them in Hellman, and they train the Kandaks as they go through an eight-week training cycle, that's going to make them better. So that's, that's what I'm doing with additional soldiers. Uh, doesn't change the force management or the 9800 number. I'm, I'm below that. So again, just a regular rotation. Somebody got a hold of that and just made it a big deal here the last couple of days in the paper. So, please, right here. Leadership weaknesses, you said. Yeah. Um, you know, what I've said publicly, and I've told President Ghani, Dr. Duell, I've testified to Congress, I said that many of the problems that I've seen, 70% uh, of them, uh, my estimation, is that they can be fixed with good leadership and then holding people accountable. You know, the last two months, there's been 92 general officer changes in the MOD. 
that Minister Stanig's eye has taken on and very courageously recommended uh, some of those of President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, and some he's been able to make on his own based on his own assessment. And in every one of those cases, I think they've made a difference. Um, you know, but for me, leadership is what really, really drives everything. Leadership is about discipline. Uh, why in some places you have a unit, all right, that may not have a lot of train, advise, and assist, uh, they have a very big threat there, uh, but that unit continues to do very well, where you have another unit, uh, maybe the same threat level, uh, but they're not doing so well. And when I take a look at that and examine it, it's just based on the leadership and getting people to do the tough things and holding discipline and hold people accountable. Um, so I think as they've made these changes at the senior levels, but I think more importantly, uh, the future of Afghanistan and the future of the security forces at the junior level and making those captains and majors and lieutenant colonels and moving those guys in the right positions of responsibility. The ones that have been trained back in the U.S. and the U.K. and Germany, they come back now with different skill sets, and we've got to put them to, to good use. So many times we train people in different, especially skill sets, and then bad leaders don't put them in the right skill sets. So if you're trained to go be a counter IED or an explosive ordnance guy, a bad leader may go put you on a checkpoint. All right? A good leader says, hey, you've been trained in this. I need to get you out in the fight and use you for the skill that you've been trained in. So that's just a small example of, of leadership. Uh, the other area I think we're doing a lot better in is your non-commissioned officer corps. You know, everybody asked me, uh, my almost 37 years of the Army, what sets the U.S. Army different from any other Army in the world? And I tell them it's our non-commissioned officers. And the, our non-commissioned officers are what we call the backbone of our, of our Army. But we hold them uh, responsible for discipline in the force. And uh, I had the great honor probably two days ago to go speak to the first ever brigade-level PCC, or pre-command course, which we run in the United States. Uh, I asked to bring it here. So we have 29 commanders and we have 11 sergeants majors in this two-week course right now. And I talked to them for about an hour and a half the other day. And as I listened to their questions, I listened to their dialogue amongst each other and the cooperation between the MOI, the MOD, the NDS, and then the sergeant majors in there, you know, I really felt good coming out of that. That's the future of Afghanistan. So leadership is really, really key as you go forward. Please. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we usually, I don't want to get out in front of uh, and give anybody an advantage like the enemy, but uh, I think what, what is known out there right now is there was an attack down in Sangin. Uh, a couple Humvees that had been captured previously were turned into V-bids. Uh, they were outside one of the cops down there. They exploded early this morning, and there were several casualties from that. They were not able to breach um, uh, that particular combat outpost. Um, casualties on both sides, they pulled off. Within the last couple hours, there's been another attack on there. Um, I think there were a couple other Humvees that were involved or had been stolen and potentially could be used. I think right now the Afghan forces have, have, uh, have a plan to go after that. And I think uh, probably in the next hour or two you'll see that there's been uh, a lot of different operations ongoing uh, down, in, down in Sangin. I had an opportunity to talk to the Minister of Defense this morning. Uh, I gathered my folks here, linked them up with uh, General Khadam Shah, and I think they have a very good plan going forward to make sure – uh, they get after what happened in saying and I may have an update before we finish the conference and I'll give that to you say again No, this this was not there are no Americans that fight down there Please Um, well, that's a great question. What I'd tell you is I've looked very hard uh, with my, my leadership here at Resident Support. I've talked to the MOI and the MOD, and we've taken a very hard look at 2015, and we always do after-action reviews, lessons learned. And so we've said, what else can the Afghans do to make sure that 2016 is not 2015, and then what can Resident Support do? So on the Afghan side, and I think uh, from the present all the way down would, would, would probably agree, there's some short-term reforms. Uh, that they've been working all working on all winter campaign things like reducing the number of checkpoints so they can be more maneuverable, uh, 
creating more more uh, operational reserves, coming up with a force generation cycle so that they can have units that have some leave time, some training time, and then fighting time, working on leadership and putting the right leaders in place, um, working on their attrition, as you talked about, you know, getting after all the, the Afghans need to focus on those four, five, six things to make sure that 16, again, is not like, like 15. They got to do a lot of training. They've surged on the training of the police this winter. There are up to about 17,000 additional trained police just because they focused on it. There, you've got some programs focused on training the ALP this winter. And then again, as I said, we're doing a lot of training with the 215th Corps and, and really reconstituting whole CANDACs down there from a, from a readiness perspective. So those are the things that the Afghans have to do to make sure that 2016 is not the same as 15. From a coalition perspective, I've gone to NATO. Uh, and I've asked NATO to take a look at certain enablers and also certain other positions for train, advise, and assist to see if they could provide that. Most of those in NATO, though, are really for 2017 and beyond. We're not in a force generation cycle to, to fix that for 2016. And then the same thing from a U.S. perspective. You know, I'm not going to get above 9,800 for 2016, so what else can I do? There's certain uh, authorities and TTPs I can take a look at, and I've gone back to my senior leadership to put that in a process to see if I can get some of those approved. I won't go through each one of those because that'll give, a, that'll give the, the enemy an opportunity to, to adjust how they fight if that gets out. So again, I think you know, that's how I'm looking at 2016 to make sure that um, uh, the Afghan security forces, are, are, you know, they're not playing on a level playing field here, that they have the advantage as they go forward. Because again, they, they don't want to repeat a 15. Uh, the coalition doesn't want to repeat a, a 15. I think 16 is going to be a very, very important year. I've used the term, you know, this is an inflection point in the Afghan security uh, forces and, and for Afghanistan. And so we're going to do everything we can to make sure it's not the same. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Some of it came under the term of force optimization. The difference last year, uh, really the winter of 2015, the issues we had then is we had, quite frankly, had some political instability. We didn't, have a, we didn't have a true Minister of Interior, a true Minister of Defense, uh, the Chief of Staff. All the senior key, key positions were in flux. Um, and so many of the things we thought we would get after in 2015, the winter, we, we just didn't get the progress we thought we would get to, uh, nor did the Afghans uh, get to where they, where they wanted to be. So some of that's been a continuation. But there are other lessons learned that, that we've taken out of that, I think, that apply to 2016 to make it a little bit different. In the back, anybody in the back? Okay, um, had a hard time hearing all of it. I think you were talking about authorities on Daesh or ISIL and the difference from 15 to 16. Yeah. Okay, okay, I got you. Thank you. Um, again, last year, nascent, you know, then, I, then they became operationally emergent as they continue to build their capacity. Uh, a lot of fighting between the Taliban and Daesh that, that kept that tamp down. But as I took a look at it, uh, listened to what they were trying to do, you know, we, we've, we put back toward our senior leadership and said we need, uh, we need the authority to go ahead and attack Daesh just like we do Al-Qaeda. And I didn't have that last year, and I have that this year. And so um, we've been able to put a little bit more pressure. This, I didn't bring in more resources to do that. I can do that with the resources that we have now. Uh, but we focus that not only from a USCT perspective because ISIL, DICE said they want to go to Europe, to the homeland of the United States, uh, but also from an Afghanistan perspective and also Pakistan. We brought Pakistan and talked to them about DICE and what they can do more. And we've had meetings with Afghanistan, Pakistan, U.S. just focused on DICE and how we, can, how we can go forward. As far as where they're coming from, you know, it started out uh, a year ago really as a lot of disenfranchised TTP. Um, that, that came into Daesh, and as they've been moving forward, I think um, 
they've had the ability to recruit uh, quite good inside of Afghanistan, well, all around the world, but inside of Afghanistan as well. Um, President Ghani would say on recruiting, he's used the term Windows 1.0 for Al-Qaeda, and he saw Daesh as Windows 7.0 because they use social media to, to recruit. I think you're tracking a week or two ago, um, uh, joint operation Afghan-U.S. Uh, struck a relay place where, where Daesh was transmitting radio, which they were getting their social media out, where they're getting their recruiting out. Uh, I think a lot of it is inside. It could be old Taliban, the disenfranchised with the Taliban, TTP, other type insurgence groups that see Daesh maybe as uh, getting more resources, they get more exposure from you guys, they think that's cool, and they want to go out and kill people. Uh, how much is coming from Syria and Iraq? Hard, hard to tell, hard, hard to measure that. Uh, we have tracked some money, very, very little amounts of money, but we do believe that uh, the senior leadership in Daesh uh, here in Afghanistan or the Khorasan province does communicate uh, with Baghdadi and Iraq and Syria. So there, there is a connection. There's probably eight, maybe nine different um, affiliates of ISIL, uh, Libya, Somalia, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan is just another one. And so they're going to try to do everything they can to impress the folks back in Syria and Iraq, but hard to tell how many people are coming from Syria and Iraq really adding to that. So if I tell you that, will that give them an advantage on how to avoid me targeting them? Because I won't do that. Um, no, bottom line is uh, most of the times last year that they were tied into any kind of tax was when they were um, posing a threat to coalition forces, a direct threat to coalition forces. Please. That's a good question. I, and, you know, I stated up front, I think not only the U.S., but the whole international community now is starting to talk in terms of long-term commitment to provide the Afghan people, the Afghan national government, the Afghan security forces, um, that, hey, we're, we're here to stay. You're going to get financial commitment for years and years. We're going to continue to build your capacity of your Afghan security forces. Um, and we're going to continue to train, advise, and assist. So, you know, I, I see that as giving confidence to the Afghan people. And it ought to send a message to the Taliban, too, that, hey, you know, when, what they thought in 15 was everybody was leaving and they could wait us out. You know, that's, that's no longer the case here. Uh, the coalition has, has said they're going to have a long-term commitment, both financially and keeping people on the ground. So I think what that should do is provide the Afghan people um, more assurances that uh, you're going to have a long, long-term partner. Again, Afghan forces have to continue to step up. They have to get better. They have to make those reforms to continue to get better. they got to interact with the people and show the people uh, that they ought to have their trust and confidence in the Afghan security forces uh, and that the, the best way forward for a stable Afghanistan uh, is to support the national unity government and to support the Afghan security forces. So I don't see provinces falling in 16, although it'll be a very, very tough fight. Look, the Taliban are having the same issues, all right? They have money issues. They have recruiting issues. They have leadership issues, all right? They're not 10 feet tall. Um, they can be beat. Their casualties last year were huge, all right? They're disgruntled. They're tired of fighting 14, 15 years. They're not seeing their family, all right? But again, um, I'm not even sure who they're fighting for. You know, they were under this guy, Mullah Omar, before, who, who had religious credentials. And now you got a guy by the name of Mansoor that has no religious credentials. And so if I was a Taliban member, I'd be thinking to myself, you know, why am I doing this? 
Why do I continue to put myself at risk? Why am I killing innocent women and children? All right, I want to go back to Afghanistan. I want to go live in peace. And President Ghani and Dr. Duhl have reached out to them to do that exactly. So, uh, and then that leadership, you know, it's not in the fight. It's in sanctuary in other countries. Uh, it's pushing them out to go do it. So again, if I was if I was Taliban out there, I'd ask that question: Why am I doing this? All right, what else? Sorry, a little uh, personal here, but you're retiring now. We thought you might be going on to uh, bigger things. Um, bigger? There's something bigger than resolute support. No. Is this, uh, no. Um, we haven't seen the, the report. Yeah. No. Again, I'm doing this on my own terms here, um, and Mrs. Campbell's terms, I think, if you talk to my wife. So when I retire, I'll have 36 years, 10 months, and 25 days in the Army. All right, that doesn't count four years at West Point. So about 41 years of my life will have been spent at uh, serving um, my great country with, two, with three terms, three tours here in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I have great trust and confidence in the president and the secretary of defense. Uh, secretary of defense called me. He offered me another four-star job after this job. I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to move my family. So I made the call to respectfully decline that nomination. I owed that to the secretary of defense. If, if you know, I wasn't behind that 100%, if my heart wasn't going to be into it, then, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. So um, I'm at peace with this decision. I'm very honored to continue, and I'll do everything I can here for the next couple of weeks to support the Afghan security forces, and then um, you know, I'll find other ways to serve down the road. So I think 37 years is a long time. Um, on the MSF or the hospital piece, you know, I've done that report. I, I came out to all of you right before Thanksgiving and, and, and told you why I thought it happened. I've moved those, those reports to, to Central Command and, and to SOCOM. Uh, I think they're in the process of redacting that. That'll, that'll come out to you at, at some point. Uh, but at no time um, that I know of personally was that tied in any kind of decisions. I think if it was, I would not have been offered another four-star level position. But, you know, 18 months, it's a long time to be gone. Um, and I think any, any of our senior leadership will tell you it's sort of like dog years, you know. So 18 months in Afghanistan or in Iraq or any deployed position, you know, most of our men and women that do that, they're working 24-7. You're not getting weekends off. So if you, if you take 18 months and times it by, it probably equals three or four years in regular time. And, uh, you know, we've got we to gotta re-energize. And, again, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to some opportunities that may be out there and then playing a little bit of golf too. Um, yep, Washington Post. Do I have time to answer this question, Michael? <laughs> okay. No, what I said is they've, they, have, they have announced that that's what they want to do. That is their intent to build a course on province, to take over Jalalabad, to move into Kunar. Uh, they want to attack Europe. They want to attack the United States. Do they have that capability today? I don't think so. But a lot of that is because of the pressure that's put on them by the Afghan security forces, by the Taliban beating up on them, and now by us continue to put pressure. Left unchecked, I think they will want to continue to grow. All right? It's sort of like, go ahead. Yeah, I think today I have what I need to go after Daesh, working alongside, again, our Afghan counterparts. Um, and if I don't think we, we have the re resources or the required authorities, then I'll raise that to my senior leadership. Again, look, I'm not bashful, all right? So I'm, I'm going to retire. We talked about that. I'm going to be straightforward with my chain of command, command and tell my best military advice as we go forward. I'm going to do the same thing with Mick Nicholson, who's a very good friend of mine, as he goes forward and lay out everything I know. And again, I've already passed forward in the last several weeks what I think we need to make 16 different than 15, and we'll keep, keep pushing that forward. But uh, any commander on the ground has a responsibility uh, to give their best military advice. And if I thought that Daesh would be a threat because we didn't have the right authorities, uh, I'd absolutely raise that. That they'll what? 
Yeah, that's a great question. That's a, the million-dollar question right there. So um, I think President Ghani, from the very first day, you know, in his inauguration speech, which I was honored to, to attend, he, he sent a message to the Taliban then and said, hey, come back to Afghanistan, join the peace process. And he's been consistent with that, and he's done some very courageous things over the last year plus, reaching out to Pakistan, which, uh, you know, President Karzai wouldn't do and others, but he knew that he had to change the dynamic and the equation of what was going on. And so I think that was a very brave decision. And he's lost a lot of political capital on that, hasn't seen some of the rewards from that, but I think over time people look back and say, that was a pretty good thing. Um, whether or not the Taliban come to the table, the peace table, I think there's a lot of Taliban that want to come to the peace table. Right now, you know, I'm not so sure who's in charge of the Taliban or if there's one person that speaks for the Taliban. I think that's where it's going to be hard to get all the right people to the table um, to do that. But the door is open. Afghanistan has to lead this process, which they're doing. And I think time, time will tell. And, um, you know, I think it's going to take some time to be able to do that. And it's going to take some help. It's going to take some help from Pakistan. It's going to take some help from China. The U.S., uh, Iran, other countries that are all tied into the region out here have to be committed uh, for safe and secure Afghanistan going way forward. And um, but again, this political process is is, is where we got to go in the end. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a hard, hard question. Um, again, Pakistan, if, if you look at the last year in Pakistan, they've had a very tough year as well. They're fighting their own fight there. I think everybody's tracking a year ago, December 14, 16 December to be exact. The Peshawar incident, incident 140 plus kids killed. Uh, Bacha Khan University just a couple weeks ago hit. So Pakistan has internal issues that they're dealing with. Uh, General Raheel, the chief of the army there, made a very courageous decision to go after uh, insurgents inside of Pakistan, and they've been committed for this for the last year plus. One of the results of that, or, the, or second order effect, is it has pushed a lot of things into Afghanistan. And in some places, the Afghan forces have been ready and have been able to counter that. In some places, they haven't. And so I think more military to military discussion, cooperation between Pakistan and Afghanistan will help that uh, as, as they go forward. As far as um, you know, Pakistan doing something to enable uh, Daesh or ISIL. You know, when I talked to General Raheel, he's absolutely committed to making sure that he can get after Daesh and ISIL as well. Um, he knows that there are people in, probably inside of Afghanistan going into Pakistan and doing bad things, and he knows there's people in Pakistan coming into Afghanistan doing bad things. It's a very porous border, and it's very hard to stop going either way. I think the key thing is if both countries and both leaders and President Ghani and and General Hill here continue to try to work together, uh, continue to uh, encourage military to military cooperation. Corps commanders on the ground uh, in Jalalabad talking to corps commanders in Pakistan, the same thing down in the south. They're only going to get better in coordinating their efforts to stop things going back and forth. And so I, th I think that's the way of the future. And uh, I'm encouraged by what I've seen here in the last couple of weeks of the mill to mill cooperation between the corps commanders. I'm encouraged by the way, at the operational level, the ANA uh, operational folks are talking to the Pakistan operational folks when there's a cross-border incident and trying to get after that very quickly. It's going to take a little bit of time to get there. They've got to build up uh, mutual trust and confidence in each other because it's taken years, or it's been years and years of this insurgency going on. Each other blames each other. You know, I think uh, with the right leadership, we'll make a difference, and they'll get after this over time. Please, maybe two more questions here and then over here.
that be developed into some sort of mill-to-mill -mill cooperation with the Taliban in order to reduce um, uh, tensions with them? Could that somehow grow into something bigger? Yeah, I'd rather have the Taliban work with Afghanistan and come to the peace table. But um, again, that, that's something that Afghanistan will have to work through. That's not something that, that I'm going to go work out. Um, that's something the Minister of Defense and, and the President and the senior military leadership will have to work through. Again, I, I don't think they're about working with the Taliban either, except for bringing the Taliban to the peace table. And, um, and then maybe they can all go after Daesh. Last question over here. Yeah, I think you know. I think we have to look at it from a whole of government approach. It just can't be the security forces. You've got to have the right governance at the district level, uh, the provincial level. Um, so I think what President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah are taking a very hard look at is making sure the governors are tied into this piece, making sure all the people are tied into it, and working together. Um, from a, again, from a coalition perspective, I have taken a look at 15. What can we do in 16? I provided those recommendations to my chain of command, uh, my senior leadership. Uh, we're working through that now. I do believe there are small adjustments we can make from a coalition perspective to make sure that we can enable our Afghan partners a little bit better in 16 than we did in 15. And again, that's based on lessons learned. I think we have to be flexible enough to be able to do that. Um, if we just look at it and say, we know this happened, but we're not going to make any adjustments, then you know, we're better than that. Shame on us if we can't, if we can't be flexible enough as well. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident we, we will be. I've got uh, great trust in, in my senior leadership as we move forward, and uh, so I, I think we'll make those adjustments. The, um, again, if I can just close here with, 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 with uh, a couple comments. Um, you know, for all of the resident support folks here, uh, to thank them and their, their, their families for allowing uh, their men and women to deploy over many, many times here, uh, put themselves in harm's way to enable our Afghan uh, brothers and sisters to really prosecute this fight. And the Afghans have been getting after this. Right. Uh, again, if you go back to the United States and all you do is read what you guys say, you think that there is no Afghanistan and that the, that the government's fallen. Right. And again, there's some tough challenges out there. Believe me, and you guys know them and I know them. Um, but we're in a whole different world here. Right. National Union government, uh, Dr. Abdullah, President Ghani are working hard to keep Afghanistan moving forward. But when they have naysayers. When they have people inside the government, when they have people make comments that the, the government's failing, that doesn't help anybody. All right? So I think the message here is everybody pulled together. Uh, all of you wouldn't be here in Afghanistan covering what you do every single day unless you had a little bit of Afghanistan in your heart as well. So I think we stand together. We help our Afghan partners move forward. And uh, I, I believe with the leadership that I've seen, the young men and women out there that sacrifice, it's an all-volunteer army, an all-volunteer police, just like we have in the U.S., uh, that they are worthy of our continued uh, investment and sacrifice. And I'm going to do everything I can the rest of the time I'm in uniform and when I become Mr. Campbell to continue to, to, uh, to impact Afghanistan. Thanks very much.